Good evening, and again, welcome to all who are gathered here this evening for our annual TKIP lecture. It's my distinct honor to introduce our lecturer this evening, Dr. Nicholas Healy. Dr. Healy is an associate professor of philosophy and culture at the Pontifical John Paul II Institute in Washington, DC. He received his doctorate from Oxford University with a dissertation on the theology of Hansers von Balthasar. And of less importance, but still a notable fact, he was my professor when I was doing doctoral studies at CUA recently. He is an editor of the North American edition of Communio, International Catholic Review, and a founding member of the Academy of Catholic Theology. He is the author of the Ex Eschatology of Hansers von Balthasar, Being as Communion, and together with David Schindler, Freedom, Truth, and Human Dignity, the Declaration on Religious Freedom. Recent articles have addressed the nature and sacramentality of marriage, the interpretation of dignitatis humanae, and the theological anthropology of Henri de Lubac and Thomas Aquinas. As one of the leading figures in the Comunio School of Theology today, Dr. Healy continues the great work begun by the likes of Henri de Lubac, Hansers von Balthasar, Jean Daniel Liu, and Joseph Ratzinger, amongst others. And so we are privileged to have him offer our Fall 22 TKIP lecture. The title of his lecture this evening <clears throat> is Henri de Lubac and the Christian Mystery of Nature and Grace. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Healy to the podium. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Haddad, for uh, the words of introduction. And a special thanks to Father Rodrigue and the faculty of the Notre Dame Seminary. It's an honor and a privilege uh, to be invited to give the TCAP lecture and to join a very distinguished list of past speakers. <clears throat> I am convinced, writes Gregory Nazianzus, that every assembly of bishops is to be avoided, for I have never experienced a happy ending to any council, only ambition and wrangling about what was taking place. <laughs> These words written by the great Cappadocian father shortly after the first council of Constantinople in 381 are cited by both John Henry Newman and Joseph Ratzinger in order to illustrate the fact that the period following an ecumenical council is often characterized by confusion, turmoil, and discord. The high water point of the Arian crisis occurred some 30 years after the solemn confession of the Council of Nicaea that Jesus Christ is homoousios with the Father. The period immediately following the Council of Trent witnessed new challenges to the reforms undertaken by the Council. We should not be too surprised that the past 60 years have been marked by confusion, turmoil, and a general crisis of faith. However, there does seem to be a unique feature or characteristic of the current discord within the church. The novelty consists in the fact that there is considerable confusion and deep disagreement concerning the basic aim or purpose of the Second Vatican Council. Unlike earlier ecumenical councils, Vatican II was not convened in order to address a specific doctrinal crisis, at least not in any obvious sense. In the Apostolic Constitution Humanae Salutis, which officially convoked the council, Pope John XXIII indicated that the council was called in order to, quote, give the church the possibility to contribute more efficaciously to the solution of the problems of the modern age. In his opening address to the council on October 11th, 1962, Pope John said the council was tasked with guarding and handing on more efficaciously the sacred deposit of faith. The substance of the ancient doctrine is one thing, the way in which it is presented is another to be faithful to Christ's gospel, an updating or aggiornamento was necessary. In short, Vatican II was conceived as an essentially pastoral council. As many others have noted, this is a remarkably open-ended program. For some Catholic theologians, the pastoral emphasis of Vatican II represents a radically new beginning, the most significant event in the life of the church since Pentecost. 
Other theologians, citing the very same texts of John the 23rd, draw the opposite conclusion. Because Vatican II was essentially a pastoral council, the council's teaching contains nothing of significance in terms of the deposit of faith. The preeminent English language historian of the Second Vatican Council, John O'Malley, has argued that conflicts over the interpretation of the council revolve around the question of what the real aim or goal of the council was. It is then highly instructive to listen to O'Malley's own account of the purpose of Vatican II. He writes, I quote, a fair but not exhaustive list of the aims of the council would go something like this. To end the stance of cultural isolation that the church was now seen as having maintained. To initiate a new freedom of expression and action within the church. To distribute more broadly the exercise of pastoral authority, especially by strengthening the role of the episcopacy and local churches vis-a-vis -vis the Holy See. To modify in people's consciousness and in the actual functioning of the church, the predominantly clerical, institutional, and hierarchical model that had prevailed. To establish a better relationship with other religious bodies. To change the teaching of the church on religious liberty and to give new support to the principle of freedom of conscience. To base theology and biblical studies more firmly on historical principles. To affirm clearly that the church was and should be affected by the cultures in which it exists. Finally, and for O'Malley, this seems to, in a way, sum up and recapitulate the other aims. To promote a more positive appreciation of the world and the relationship of the church to it. End of quote. Now, notice what is missing from O'Malley's lengthy articulation of the purpose of Vatican II. There is not a single reference to the figure of Jesus Christ or the mystery of God's love or the church's responsibility to hand on the faith received from the apostles, or the church's mission of proclaiming the gospel to every creature. In order to grasp the significance of this lacuna, it is necessary to focus attention on the final item in O'Malley's list. The purpose of Vatican II was to promote a more positive appreciation of the world and of the relationship of the church to it. At one level, this claim is undeniably true. There is ample evidence to support this thesis in the writings of John the 23rd, Paul the Sixth, and in the conciliar documents themselves. But O'Malley's formulation calls for further discernment and reflection. Why did the Second Vatican Council seek a more positive relationship with the world? What is the source and measure of the church's relation to the world? How and in what sense does the figure of Jesus Christ reveal the truth of the world's origin and end? Underlying these questions about the church world relation is the perennial issue of nature and grace. So in order to better understand the fundamental aim of the council and the council's central doctrinal claim regarding the figure of Jesus Christ revealing the truth of human nature, it is necessary to consider the debate over nature and grace that preceded the council. So my aim in what follows, to present the contribution of the French Jesuit Henri de Lubac whose writings inaugurated the contemporary debate on the mystery of the supernatural. So uh, three, three parts to the lecture that follows. Part one will just introduce the question of nature and grace. Part two will try to unfold de Lubac's position by outlining four theses on the mystery of the supernatural. And then finally, a third part will attempt a sort of speculative unfolding or development of de Lubac's theology by way of reflecting on the relationship between natural marriage or the natural institution of marriage and its sacramental character. So, part one. Henri Dulbach's lifelong effort to help Catholic theology return to an understanding of the supernatural, at once more traditional, more faithful to the thought of Thomas Aquinas, and more deeply rooted in the mystery of Jesus Christ unfolds on two interrelated levels. His first and most basic concern was to recover the unity of creation and redemption in light of God's plan to recapitulate all things in Christ. By assuming human nature and going to the end of love, the Logos, writes Maximus the Confessor, established himself as the innermost depth of the Father's goodness while also displaying in himself the very goal for which his creatures manifestly received the beginning of their existence. The ground and pattern for the original and abiding integrity and the ultimate destiny of human nature is the hypostatic union of God and man in Christ. 
The hidden center and source for Dulebach's thinking about nature and grace is the mystery of God's love revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. In a key essay titled The Light of Christ, he writes, a great deed was done for the world 20 centuries ago, the deed of charity. This deed of love, Jesus, it is you yourself. You are not merely God's messenger. You are his living and substantial appearance. Through you, he has not only spoken, rather his language is an action. His word is a deed. It is you yourself. You, Jesus, on your cross, the act of uniting heaven and earth. Uniting, we might say, nature and grace. The second level of Dulebach's contribution to the question of nature and grace, which is admittedly more technical and more controversial, involves the interpretation of texts from Thomas Aquinas on the ultimate end of human nature, together with related texts on the natural desire to see the essence of God. In his seminal book, Ce Naturel, published in 1946, Dulebach argued that certain aspects of Aquinas' thought had been obscured and misrepresented as a result of the early modern theory of pure nature, which attributed to human nature an exclusively natural or proportionate ultimate end. So let me explain this a bit more. According to St. Thomas, in his divine liberality, God created human nature with an ultimate end that is radically beyond the power of human nature. It follows that human beings can only attain their true final end, deifying participation in the very life of God through a new gift of grace. So Aquinas writes, even though man's nature is inclined to his ultimate end, he cannot reach it by nature, but only by grace, this owing to the loftiness of that end. The natural desire to see the essence of God is a sign that human nature has be been created for the sake of supernatural communion with God. Human beings are made for and desire a fulfillment that can only be attained through the gratuitous gift of God. In the early modern period, Aquinas's finely balanced teaching on the twofold action of God, the effectus naturae and the effectus gratiae, was resisted and then reinterpreted on the basis of an overextension of a philosophical axiom. The new idea, which gained currency among Thomists in the 16th century, is that the final end of nature must be strictly proportionate to nature. In other words, nature must be able to attain its final end by virtue of its own powers. This idea of strict proportionality precluded the possibility of a natural desire for something that is radically beyond nature. In the words of Kajitan, natural desire does not extend beyond the capacity of nature. Once this premise was accepted, Thomas's teaching that there is a natural desire for the beatific vision became almost unintelligible. At the same time and for the same reason, Thomas's doctrine that the ultimate end of human nature is supernatural beatitude was reinterpreted to mean that human nature as originally constituted by God has an exclusively natural or proportionate end, natura pura. On this reading, the gift of grace modifies nature in the sense of giving it a new end. In the eyes of Dulubach, the neo-Thomist axiom that the final end of nature and the desire of nature must be strictly proportionate to nature represents an unfortunate departure from the doctrine of Aquinas. The result was a weakening of the organic link between nature and grace, between the order of creation and redemption. It became more difficult to understand how the Christian mystery surpassingly fulfills the deepest desire of the human heart. And it became more difficult to see how and in what sense the mystery of Jesus Christ reveals the original purpose and meaning of creation itself. It is undeniable that Dulebach's writings on nature and grace have affected a shift in the entire edifice of Catholic theology. As interpreted and developed by John Paul II and Benedict XVI, both of whom acknowledge an indebtedness to Dulebach, the Second Vatican Council presents the twofold gift of nature and grace as united without confusion or separation in the person of Jesus Christ, who is, quote, the key, the center, and the purpose, finem, of the whole of history. In the words of Gaudium et Spes, Christ the Lord, Christ the new Adam, in the very revelation of the mystery of the Father and his love, fully reveals man to himself and brings to light his high calling. For the ultimate vocation of man is in fact one and divine. More recently, a number of authors have questioned the adequacy of Dulebach's account of nature and grace. 
The French Jesuit was mindful of the ebb and flow of Catholic thinking. He would not be too surprised by the rehabilitation of the theory of pure nature. And the contemporary resurgence of the idea of pure nature stems in part from a wholly legitimate concern to address the impoverishment of the concept of nature in modernity. In addition, the proponents of pure nature argue that if human nature in itself already tends toward the supernatural, then the gratuitous character of grace has been compromised. De Lubac shares these concerns even as he questioned the provenance and the utility of the modern idea of pure nature. So the unresolved issue at the heart of the contemporary debate is how best to understand and characterize nature's original openness to the new gift of deifying grace. As interpreted by de Lubac, St. Thomas's analogical understanding of finality serves to hold together both the essential difference between nature and grace and the unity of God's plan accomplished in Christ. While both de Lubac and Aquinas speak of a twofold beatitude for human nature, one proportionate to nature, one surpassing nature. The true finis ultimis of human nature is supernatural beatitude. And the natural desire for an end that is beyond nature testifies to the unity of God's plan for creation. As aptly stated in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the desire for God is written in the human heart because man is created by God and for God, and God never ceases to draw man to himself. The neo thomas position, as formulated by Kajitan and reaffirmed by contemporaries such as Stephen Long and Lawrence Feingold, rejects the possibility that nature as such can desire an end that is beyond nature. Prior to the modification of grace, human nature is pure nature in the sense that its final end and its natural desire are strictly proportionate to nature. So for proponents of pure nature, the openness of nature is best characterized as a non-repugnance or a specific obediential potency to acquiring a new end through the gift of grace. So given this recent criticism and, and a renewed interest in Dulebach's theology of nature and grace, it may be helpful to restate his basic position, which remained remarkably consistent from his earliest publications on the history of the word supernaturalis in the 1930s through his brief catechesis on nature and grace, published in 1980. So four, four theses on nature and grace. Part two. In a preface to his 1965 book, The Mystery of the Supernatural, de Lubac describes the fundamental aim of his various writings on the theme of the supernatural. I quote, all I have tried to demonstrate is contained in a single idea. It is to establish or illustrate the one idea that all my arguments are directed. I would instantly abandon any that turned in the end to compromise or obscure it. It is an idea so fundamental that it has been proclaimed often with total unanimity in all the ages of Christendom. Unfortunately, at the beginning of our own age, it seemed for a time to become obscured. So what's the fundamental idea? What, what's the one idea? He says, quote, man's relationship to God who has made us for himself and never ceases to draw us toward him remains essentially the same. There is always in primeval nature, just as in nature has developed through history, a depth, a living response, a natural desire, a force upon which freely given grace finds something to work. As the Greeks used to say, the incarnate logos gathers the seeds planted by the creating logos. The Latins expressed it in different terms. Man, as God's image, is fitted to enter into communion with him in liberty of mind and in initiative of love. This is what we must, if only as a duty to God, continue to clarify with all the means that this age places at our disposal. This is the fundamental truth, which we must never allow to be obscured or compromised. OK, so Dulubach's understanding of the fundamental truth of man's relation to God can be unfolded, I think, in, in four interrelated theses. First thesis, as created by God and for God, the ultimate or final end of human nature is supernatural beatitude. This truth is both ancient and common to the entire Christian tradition. Augustine's well-known words sum up and express the common faith of the church. You have made us for yourselves and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Writing in the 12th century, Richard of St. Victor bears witness to an unbroken tradition of reflection on this theme. God, the highest good and immutable good, made the rational creature 
in order to make it a partaker of his beatitude. In his own time, Aquinas confirmed this common teaching on the final end of human nature by developing the biblical image of a vision of God. The ultimate end of an intellectual creature, he writes, is the vision of God in his essence. For Augustine, Aquinas, and de Lubac, this supernatural finality is bestowed by God ab initio, in the very creation of human beings made in the image of God. In other words, God has inscribed this finality in human nature itself, because as Aquinas teaches, our intellect is made for the purpose of seeing God. Or in the formulation of de Lubac, nature is made for the supernatural. Each of the following three theses can be read as unfolding and safeguarding this foundational claim. So second thesis, the ultimate end of human nature is radically beyond nature's innate power or abilities. It follows that human nature can only attain its final end through a new gift of grace. This thesis highlights the transcendent, supernatural, and gratuitous character of Christian beatitude. We must distinguish, de Lubac writes, between the first gift of creation and the second wholly distinct, wholly supereminent gift, the ontological call to deification, which will make of man, if he responds to it, a new creature. The abiding difference between nature and grace is grounded in the causal action of God with respect to his creation. The promise of eternal life with God, beatific vision, exceeds the power of nature. This divine gift that elevates human nature, thus allowing nature to attain its supernatural ultimate end, is fittingly called grace. Grace is not a constitutive part of human nature. It is, de Lubac writes, quote, a certain form, a certain superadded perfection, which must be added over and above human nature in order that man might be ordered appropriately to his end. Or as Aquinas argues, no created intellect can possibly attain to the vision of the divine essence except by the agency of God, who surpasses all creatures. For man's happiness consists in seeing God, which is called life everlasting, and it is impossible to attain thereto except by God's gift of grace. Now, Aquinas was mindful that his teaching that the final end of human nature is beyond the power of nature posed a certain difficulty. So he raises a really great objection. He says, it would seem that man can attain beatitude by his natural power, for nature does not fail in necessary things, but nothing is so necessary to man as that he attain the last end. Therefore, this is not lacking to human nature. Therefore, man can attain beatitude by his natural powers. He responds, human nature did not fail man in things necessary, although it gave him not the wherewithal to attain beatitude, since this it could not do. But it did give him free will, by which he can turn to God, that he may make him beatified. For what we do by means of our friends is done in a sense by ourselves. So human beings are made for an end that we are unable to attain without help from another. This is supremely fitting for creatures who receive their being from another. Ontological humility and gratitude are reflected in the very structure of nature, both as created and elevated in grace to the astonishing gift of participation in the divine nature. So third thesis, there is a natural desire to see the essence of God. The natural desire for beatific knowledge of God is a sign that human nature was created in the image of God and destined for eternal blessedness with God, first thesis. The, the desire for God opens nature from its innermost depths to a mystery that infinitely surpasses nature. What is desired by nature is precisely beyond the reach of what nature can attain by its own powers. Authentic desire is structurally receptive. It is a positive openness to the gratuitous gift of another. When the end is beyond the capacity of the agent striving to attain it, Aquinas argues, it is looked for from another's bestowing. The natural desire to see the essence of God provides a crucial point of contact between nature and grace but it also safeguards the transcendence and gratuity of Christian beatitude. To be created in the image of God with a desire to see God is to desire beatitude only in the context of a friendship that is gratuitous. The human spirit, writes de Lubac, desires God as one desires a gift, the free and gratuitous communication of a personal being. 
As a sign of the depth and breadth of God's plan for creation, the natural desire for God is essentially mysterious. On the one hand, the desire is truly natural. It is essentially in our nature and expresses the heart of it, says de Lubac. The natural desire to see the essence of God is not simply the result of grace modifying nature, although it remains true that grace will elevate and radically transform this desire. On the other hand, the desire for God is itself a gift from God. Although not yet a grace, the natural desire for God is a sign that God created us for himself and never ceases to draw us toward himself. Perhaps we could say that the supernatural finality and the desire to see the essence of God are in human nature, but not of human nature. Fourth thesis. God could have created intellectual natures not destined for supernatural beatitude. This is the hypothetical possibility famously affirmed by Pope Pius XII in his 1950 encyclical, Humane Generis. Quote, others destroy the gratuity of the supernatural order since God, they say, cannot create intellectual beings without ordering and calling them to the beatific vision. De Lubac accepts this teaching as true and as consonant with his writings on the supernatural both before and after the publication of Humane Generis. The mistaken idea that Humane Generis condemned the position of de Lubac has proven surprisingly resilient, despite evidence to the contrary. On several occasions, de Lubac noted not only his fundamental agreement with the encyclical, but the possible dependence of Humane Generis on his own 1949 essay, The Mystery of the Supernatural, which explicitly affirmed the possibility that God could create human nature without ordering that nature to the surpassing gift of supernatural beatitude. Undergirding de Lubac's interpretation of Humane Generis is an analogical understanding of nature and finality. The intellectual beings in the hypothetical order of Humane Generis would be analogical to human nature as it actually exists, but not the same in every respect. Why? In this providential economy, God has in fact created human beings that are destined for eternal life. In his divine liberality, God has inscribed this finality in human nature itself, not in the sense that supernatural beatitude is part of human nature, but rather it is the end of nature. In the providential economy that actually exists, human nature is made for or inclined to an end that surpasses nature. So the question that needs to be explored further is whether this hierarchically structured twofold finality is rooted in nature as created by God, which is de Lubac's position, or whether as Feingold claims, this twofold finality is the result of grace modifying nature in the sense that a super added grace bestows a new finality on human nature. And at the heart of this question is the concept of pure nature. So part three, uh, the unresolved question, natura pura. Throughout his various writings on the mystery of the supernatural, de Lubac criticized what he called the system of pure nature as a relatively modern and unhelpful development in Catholic theology. So it's not surprising that critics of de Lubac have rallied in defense of the concept of natura pura. What exactly is meant by this term? Uh, consider two representative attempts to explain or define pure nature. So the first, quote, we focus our attention on the notion of pure nature itself, that is, on the idea of man in solis naturalibus constitutus. Pure nature thus refers to what defines us as human. Second quote, pure nature is a concept of nature and especially human nature as complete in itself not dependent for its preservation on divine action. Pure nature, moreover, is unable to enjoy any form of relation with God, either in its being or in its knowledge. Now, the first of these two citations is presented in the context of a fundamental criticism of de Lubac. The second is taken from a book sympathetic to de Lubac's theology. In my opinion, both of these accounts of pure nature miss the target in a fairly basic way. As understood by de Lubac, the modern idea of pure nature involves a claim about the final end of human nature as created by God. The system of pure nature described by de Lubac does not refer to the definitional integrity of human nature, i.e. what defines us as human. With the entire Catholic tradition, de Lubac affirms that grace presupposes nature in its integrity. Created nature, he says, has its own stability and its own definite structure. 
de Lubac confers with the words of Blaise Romeyer, quote, only by taking care not to disregard the relative specific consistency of our nature, by taking it as a genuine substratum of grace, can we fulfill the requirements either of belief or thought. What de Lubac finds objectionable in the modern theory of pure nature is not the emphasis given to the integrity and intelligibility of nature in distinction from grace. Instead, his concern is to his concern is to overcome what he considers to be a one-sided or partial understanding of the finality of human nature. In other words, he opposes the idea that human nature itself has been created with an exclusively natural final end. Or to state the same point differently, de Lubac opposes the idea that it's only with sanctifying grace that human nature acquires a new and additional supernatural finality. Second, the system of pure nature is not identical with the affirmation that God could have created intellectual natures not ordered and called to supernatural beatitude. As noted above, Pius XII, Henri de Lubac, and contemporary neo thomists all agree in upholding this hypothetical possibility. We know this, writes de Lubac, on two counts, what we know of God and what we know of creatures. God could never have been constrained or required by anything or anyone outside of himself to give me being, nor could he be constrained or required by anything or anyone outside of himself to imprint on my being a supernatural finality. Therefore, my nature cannot possess any claim to it. So in summary, the system of pure nature is organized around the idea that human nature in itself, prior to grace, has an exclusively natural or proportionate final end. Undergirding the theory of pure nature is the philosophical axiom that a nature must be able to attain its final end by virtue of its own power. The corollary of this thesis is that there can be no natural desire for supernatural beatitude. Or in the words of de Lubac's teacher, Pedro de Koch, desire is natural insofar as the goal to which it aspires is proportionate to nature. In other words, possible to it. So in light of the foregoing account of pure nature, let me attempt to clarify the current state of the question in this debate between de Lubac and his contemporary neo thomist critics. The first step is to identify some areas of agreement that are often, but I think mistakenly, put forward as disputed questions. The key issue is not whether or not God could have created an order of pure nature. Uh, as I stated, uh, all agree that this hypothetical order is possible. Second, de Lubac and, his con and the contemporary proponents of natura pura affirm the existence of a proportionate natural end that is subordinate to the finis ultimis. Thirdly and more generally, the issue under dispute is not the abiding significance of nature and the natural law within the Christian economy of redemption or the indispensable role of philosophy. The real issue that continues to divide de Lubac and his Neo-Thomas critics is whether or not there is a positive opening in nature itself to what is beyond nature. Regarding this question, Lawrence Feingold offers a helpful summary of the two basic positions. For the contemporary proponents of pure nature, our intrinsic supernatural finality is the result of an accidental form given through baptism. For de Lubac, our supernatural finality is essential to our concrete nature and given in the creation of nature itself. In the eyes of de Lubac, by denying that human nature itself is created with an ultimate end that exceeds nature, and that there is thus a truly natural desire for what is beyond nature, visio beatifica, the proponents of pure nature overlook the hidden depths and the transcendence that belong to nature itself. For de Lubac, the transcendent mystery of God's plan for creation and redemption is not simply on the side of grace. It is reflected in the very structure of created nature itself. Okay, now, given the subtlety of this difference, oh, why is this an important question? Are, are we Catholic theologians fiddling while Rome burns? Um, I'm sympathetic to this concern. This, it's a good question to ask. Um, and there, there are some reports of a fire in Rome. But the, the question of nature and grace remains important, both in itself and because it mediates how we understand the truth of the Christian faith as illuminating and informing every aspect of our lives. An implicit understanding of nature and grace mediates how we conceive the church's relationship 
to the world, to the created order in all of its dimensions, including the political and economic orders, the order of culture. At the heart of Dulebach's theological vision is the claim that Jesus Christ not only reveals the truth of God as triune love, he also reveals what it means to be truly human. A life of sanctity or holiness is not only an extraordinary sign of God's grace, it is the most truly human form of life, the most natural thing. Okay, so to, to unfold this, this claim and hopefully to advance the current debate, I'll turn now to a particular instance of the relationship between nature and grace. That is, the relationship between marriage and the order of creation and marriage as elevated to a sacrament. In an address to the Roman Rhoda in 2003, John Paul II suggested that reflection on the relationship between the natural and sacramental dimensions of marriage is a fruitful way to investigate more deeply the mystery of the relationship between human nature and grace. And there are several reasons why this question regarding the nature and sacramentality of marriage represents a promising path for a deeper understanding of the mystery of the supernatural. First, marriage has a unique status among the sacraments insofar as the institution of marriage is rooted in the order of creation. As an officium nature, marriage plays a paradigmatic role in safeguarding and disclosing the truth of human nature as created by God. A second reason for thinking about nature and grace in connection with marriage stems from the current crisis of marriage, which is a crisis of both faith and reason. An adequate response to this crisis requires a renewed understanding of the importance of the natural dimension of marriage, coincident with the deeper awareness of how the sacramental mystery of Christ both presupposes and reveals the full truth of marriage. So the fact that marriage belongs to the order of creation, pre-existing the economy of grace revealed and communicated in Christ, raises uh, an important and really fascinating question. Uh, what exactly is the difference between a natural marriage and a sacramental marriage? What does the grace of the sacrament uh, add to marriage? The answer to this question involves a rich and complicated development of doctrine from Augustine's reflection on the goods of marriage through medieval sacramental theology to post-Tridentine disputes between the church and state over jurisdiction over marriage. Uh, let me just state two, two points. The newness of a sacramental marriage is given in and through the mystery of Christ himself. Here we should recall the words of Irenaeus. He brought all newness by bringing himself. The essential difference between a natural marriage and a sacramental marriage is grounded in the gift of grace concretely bestowed in and through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because Christ has shared his own life and love, the marriage of two baptized persons is dignified with being a real symbol of his spousal love for the church. Through the grace of the sacrament of marriage, the reciprocal self-giving of the spouses participates in the very charity of Christ who gave himself on the cross, John Paul II. Secondly, this newness is paradoxical. Christ did not establish a new outward sign or a new form for entering into marriage. Instead, he recalled the original truth of creation. He who made them from the beginning made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. Therefore, what God has joined, let no man put asunder. Rather than adding something to marriage from outside, Christ reveals the fullness of God's original plan for marriage, while accomplishing this plan through his death and resurrection. Henceforth, marriage between baptized represents and participates in Christ's love for the church. Holding these two truths together, the natural institution and the elevation of marriage to a sacrament by Christ, Catholic doctrine affirms the inseparability of the sacrament and the institution or contract of marriage. A single text from Pope Leo XIII will have to serve to uh, illustrate this teaching. So in his encyclical Arcanum, the first encyclical letter ever written on marriage, Pope Leo XIII says, let no one be deceived by this distinction which some civil jurists have so strongly insisted upon, the distinction by virtue of which they sever the matrimonial contract from the sacrament with the intent to hand over the contract to the power and will of the rulers of the state while reserving questions concerning the sacrament to the church. 
a distinction or severance of this kind cannot be approved, for it is certain that in Christian marriage, the contract is inseparable from the sacrament. For Christ our Lord added to marriage the dignity of a sacrament, but marriage is the contract itself, whenever that contract is lawfully concluded. The implications of this doctrine of inseparability are endless. In the first place, what is sacred or sacramental about marriage is the marriage itself. Defending and upholding the natural institution of marriage with its nature, essential properties, and its ends is an inner requirement of the church's solicitude for the sacrament. At the same time, the novelty of Christ discloses the deepest truth of the original structure and the ultimate finality of marriage itself. Precisely as a natural institution, marriage points beyond itself to the mystery of grace concretized in the person of Christ. Without laying claim to what can only be received as a gratuitous gift, there is a positive opening in marriage itself to the surpassing fulfillment of representing and mediating divine love. From the very beginning, writes Leo XIII, marriage was a kind of foreshadowing of the incarnation of the Son. Therefore, there abides in it something holy and religious, not extraneous but innate, not derived from men but implanted by nature. So I suggested above that the key issue that continues to divide de Lubac and his contemporary neo-Thomas critics is the question of how to conceive the original openness of nature. The logic of pure nature tends to resent, represent nature's openness as a specific obediential potency to acquiring through grace a new and additional finality. De Lubac, on the contrary, thinks of nature as originally and constitutively made for an ultimate end that surpasses nature, hence the natural desire for the supernatural. Mindful of the limits of analogy, we can transpose these two interpretations of nature to the question of how to think about marriage within the order of creation. The theory of pure nature would suggest an account of the natural institution of marriage as having an exclusively natural end. The grace of Christ would bring a new and additional finality to marriage. De Lubac's theology suggests an understanding of, of marriage as originally and constitutively ordered to something radically beyond itself namely the mystery of Christ's love for the church. For de Lubac, the transcendent supernatural finality of marriage would be an original and structural feature of marriage itself as created by God. The positive openness of natural marriage would represent a kind of prefigurement or foreshadowing of God's plan to recapitulate all things in Christ. In my opinion, de Lubac's theology of nature and grace provides a more ample foundation for the church's teaching on the inseparability of institution and sacrament, precisely because there is a positive opening to the supernatural at the heart of the natural institution of marriage. This natural reality itself can be elevated to signify and participate in the greater mystery of Christ's love. In one sense, a sacramental marriage is more truly a marriage. At the same time, thinking through Dulebach's thesis in connection with marriage sheds new light on the importance of the natural end that is subordinate to the finis ultimus. The natural end of marriage is the procreation and education of children. This natural end is not displaced or evacuated by the elevation of marriage to the sacramental mystery of a participation in Christ's love. As suggested above, the inseparability of institution and sacrament has implications in both directions. On the one hand, the natural dimension of marriage is constitutively ordered beyond itself and is thus capable of mediating divine love. On the other hand, the sacramental dimension both presupposes and deepens the natural reality of marriage. The natural dimension of marriage opens from within to the supernatural, not simply because it is imperfect, but because its natural integrity is itself a sign of the greater mystery of God's plan accomplished in Christ. To obscure the natural dimension of marriage, writes John Paul II, entails the implicit denial of its sacramentality. It is precisely the correct understanding of the sacramentality in the Christian life which spurs us to a new estimation of its natural dimension." End of quote. This leads to a final point. An affirmation of the significance of the natural end of marriage suggests a new way of thinking about finality that goes beyond the, neo the neo-Thomist axiom of proportionality. If the natural end of marriage is the procreation and education of children, then already at the natural level, 
there is something like a desire for an end that radically transcends the innate power or ability of human nature. Parents do not create a child, but procreate him, which is to say their own self-transcending activity is a disposal of nature to a causal principle that transcends nature, namely God's properly creative act. A child can only be received in truth as a gratuitous gift, yet children remain the proper natural finality of marriage. The principle at the root of the theory of pure nature, that the end of nature and the innate desire of nature must be proportionate to nature, is inadequate, not only in relation to the supernatural, but also within the order of creation itself. At the very heart of nature is a positive opening to the unforeseen mystery of God's love. The tradition, says de Lubac, presents us with two affirmations at once, not in opposition, but as a totality. Man cannot live except by the vision of God, and that vision of God depends totally on God's good pleasure. One has no right to weaken either, even in order to grasp the other more firmly. So let me conclude by returning to Father O'Malley's claim that the purpose of the Second Vatican Council was to promote a more positive appreciation of the world and the relationship of the church to it. These words, or rather some variation on these words, continue to be echoed by countless theologians. Richard Gallaudetz argues that, quote, Vatican II remains a fundamental turning point in the history of the church because it affected a shift in the stance of the Catholic Church from one of isolation, fear, and condemnation to one of openness and dialogue with the wider world. Vatican II, writes Maureen Sullivan, expresses a profound change from being a church in conflict with the world to being a church in dialogue with the world. Despite a history of mistrust, disdain, and outright condemnation, the church has reconciled with the world." End of quote. What is missing from these reports of a new appreciation, dialogue, and reconciliation is reflection on why the church is interested in the world. What is the source and measure of the church's mission of entering into the world? In seeking an answer to this question, we should be guided by Pope Paul VI's words. This is uh, the first time he addressed the council at the start of the second session. He says, from what point, dear brethren, do we set out? What is the road we intend to follow? What is the goal we propose to ourselves? These three very simple and at the same time very important questions have, as we know, only one answer. Namely, here at this very hour, we should proclaim Christ to ourselves and to the world around us. Christ our beginning, Christ our life, Christ our guide, Christ our hope and our end. Let no other light be shed on this council but Christ, the light of the world. This confession of faith in Jesus Christ is the pastoral program of the Council. It's the centrality and the Catholicity of Jesus Christ as Alpha and Omega, the one in whom all things hold together. The reason why the Council undertakes a dialogue with the modern world is because of the saving mystery of Christ's love. In giving the substance of his life and love to the Church, Christ reveals the truth of human nature as created by God and for God. After Henri de Lubac, perhaps the best way to contemplate the mystery of nature and grace is to reflect on the figure of Christ as the living and personal unity of nature and grace. Christ reveals the deepest truth of human nature as a gift that God himself presupposes in the mystery of the incarnation. Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension reveal the supreme eschatological fulfillment of human nature as deified by being included within the Trinitarian exchange of life and love. His word, writes de Lubac, is a deed, the act of uniting heaven and earth. Thank you. <laughs>